So uh, first, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I know that there's a ton of things going on this week uh, around NDI, so I appreciate you guys turning out. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, Laura Dinaris from American University. Uh, she is a leading scholar in the, in the realm of internet governance, and she has a new book coming out called The Global War on Internet Governance. Uh, and she's been around town presenting at some of the, the most preeminent institutions and think tanks around town, and she's really considered a thought leader in this in this domain. Uh, so she doesn't have a presentation, uh, PowerPoint presentation. It's going to be more of a, a, a discussion about what internet governance is, and then a, dis a, dis a discussion afterwards on questions that you might have, specifically on what it, how it pertains to your work at, uh, here at NDI as well. So. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very delighted to be here at NDI, and I appreciate the invitation. Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, the title of my remarks, uh, which I'm hoping will just be more of a discussion than a formal presentation, is The Global War for Internet Governance. This is the title of my upcoming book, as mentioned, and I decided to pick somewhat of a provocative title because in my experience and opinion, the spaces that are deciding internet governance are the new spaces where political and economic power is flowing around the world. Many of them are contested. Uh, so what my book tries to do is to make these contested spaces visible. Many of them are behind the scenes. They're concealed in technological complexity. They're concealed in institutional complexity. So I try to make this issue of how the internet is governed visible to a broad audience. And I also try to uncover some of um, what, what I consider to be concerns about the future of internet governance. Every time I give a talk about this subject, it seems like there's a major thing in the news going on related to internet governance, and it usually just feeds right into uh, the discussion in a very useful and sometimes problematic way. So what is the big news? Uh, there are several things this week going on, but um, certainly, um, as I'm sure you've been following very closely, we have the information about the leaked um, Verizon Business Service telephone records and that being turned over to the FBI and the NSA and the whole PRISM program. And the, the interesting part of the story is not just the kind of surveillance that's going on, but also the media the media's role in sometimes misrepresenting what's actually going on because of technical complexity or exaggerating what's going on in a certain area and underplaying it in another. It's very interesting to see how this works out. But the, the whole PRISM issue that is in the public discourse right now is useful to emphasize how issues of internet governance are related to issues of innovation, to what private industry is doing, delegated censorship, and of course privacy and the potential chilling effects on freedom of expression. So what I'll, I'll do is I'll try to use some of these issues that are raised by the current controversy over PRISM as an organizing framework for some of my remarks today. So I thought I would try to do two things. I want to explain how the internet is currently governed. It's the first thing. The second thing I'd like to do is raise some of the concerns I have for the future of this governance and how it is evolving. It's a very vital area of public policy because technologies of internet governance mediate civil liberties. Freedom of expression, privacy, they certainly are entangled in national security issues. They affect innovation policy on a global level. They affect democracy. They affect the ability to vote, the ability for voices to be heard. But the decentralized nature of these technologies is really shifting uh, control over these various policy areas away from what we would consider to be traditional nation state governance into the realm of private ordering and what private companies are doing, into the realm of technical design and into the realm of these new institutions that have been developed over the last 10 to 20 years to oversee governance of the internet. So there really is a shift that's part of what makes it so interesting. Uh, and uh, another point that I'd like to get across today is how some of these struggles are actually about the thing that's being governed, but they're also proxies for other political and economic power struggles that are going on. So that will certainly be a theme that I bring up throughout uh, our discussion today. But what jumps to your mind when you think about internet governance? SOPA. SOPA, right, so intellectual property rights enforcement and uh, freedom of expression issues, the tension between access to knowledge and innovation policy, right? 
um, it, it really does conjure up a, a host of, if you're just looking at them in a, a vacuum, seemingly unrelated controversies. But they all tie together uh, through in a number of ways. So you, you might think of internet outages in Syria over recent political turmoil, or the Egyptian internet outage. You might think of, just to use a private industry example, Google's decision to not acquiesce to government pressure to remove the incendiary Innocence of Muslims video, so how a private company handled uh, this video that was online. You might think about some of the media narratives that are dominating right now about the United Nations taking over internet governance. That's a big um, issue and really has raised a lot of attention to internet governance um, over that. And of course, cybersecurity issues jump to mind. But everyone in this room is on social media in a number of different platforms. And you know that there are constantly changing privacy policies of these platforms. So that's also a form of internet governance. So these issues uh, that I mentioned are in the public sphere to a certain extent, all of the ones that I mentioned. But they exist only at the surface of a very complicated iceberg of internet governance that involves many different institutions, many kinds of technological platforms, and uh, the role of the nation state as well as international treaties. So it's a bit of a complicated area. How does internet governance work? Point one I'll make is that it's not a completely new issue. That internet governance has been going on since, uh, the since 1969, really and into the 70s and through the 80s, and it's evolved a lot over the years. So what are the, some of the things that have been governed um, during this time? So someone has had to be responsible for setting the standards, the rules for how computers interoperate. Very technical area, but one with policy implications, which I'll discuss in a moment. Someone has had to coordinate critical internet resources that are necessary to use the internet, such as domain names, internet protocol addresses, and, and other unique numbers. Someone has responded to internet security attacks. I was actually at Cornell University as a graduate student when the very first worm took down a very large part of the internet in 1988, the Morris worm. Been very interested in cybersecurity ever since then. Someone has responded to cybersecurity threats throughout the history of the internet. Someone has ultimately decided in designing some of these technologies, what values will be designed into the technologies. And uh, someone, ha someone has to decide when content is removed. We'll come back to that issue. It's a really big one. So what I'd like to do is um, go through some examples of how this internet governance works. There are many different ways to create a taxonomy for discussing this, describing it, and studying it. What I like to do is break it down into six different areas of governance. And I'll mention these areas really quickly, and then I'll go through each one and give a few examples. So um, I'll start with control of critical internet resources. There are setting internet standards will be the second area that I discuss. It's a little bit about cybersecurity and the, some institutions that maybe you haven't heard of and some that you have that are responsible for responding to our centralized points of control over the resource about that to internet security threats. Then I'll discuss um, a few issues related to interconnection. The internet is not a cloud. It actually has pipes. It has buildings that you can go into. Uh, companies make agreements to conjoin, and there are a lot of policy issues that occur at these uh, interstices. And then I'll talk a little bit about the policy role of information intermediaries like Twitter, Google, cloud computing platforms, and uh, finally, intellectual property rights enforcement that occurs in technical architecture. So that's how I like to, to break down the taxonomy. But as I said, there are many other ways to group it. So if that sounds good, I'll just uh, start by saying a little bit about critical internet resources. The term CIR or critical internet resources. The internet governance is an acronym soup. CIR usually refers to three different things, all related to uh, resources necessary to keep the internet operational. One of these is domain names, like twitter.com. Another one is uh, the IP addresses, or the unique binary numbers that are necessary in order to use the internet. Uh, there's a standard uh, 32 bits um, as the prevailing standard, and there's also an expansion of that. But that's IP addresses or internet protocol addresses, also called internet addresses, are an example of these critical 
internet resources. There's also something that you might not have heard of called autonomous system numbers. How many people are familiar with those? It's a very important critical internet resource because um, it's a number that is assigned to a network operator so that they can be part of the internet's backbone and exchange information with other providers. So these are really essential numbers binary numbers and alphanumeric web addresses that are necessary for the internet to operate. Collectively, they're the core virtual identifiers that the internet cannot operate without, so they're very important. I always like to go to this most technical area first because um, it is such a crucial area. Now, the requirement that each of these numbers or na strings of names be globally unique has necessitated a certain form of governance. So you can imagine what that might be. Um, someone has to make sure that each IP address is globally unique. And someone distributes it around the world. Um, so there have been a lot of power struggles over this, dating back for a very, very long time. Um, many of these struggles have related to tensions between the United States government and the historic role or the historic um, relationship that the United States government, in particular the Commerce Department, has with critical internet resources versus um, goals of uh, other countries to have a more internationalized governance over these critical internet resources. So this has been a tension that has been going on for a long time and it's really unresolved in a lot of ways. Um, I'll mention some of the global institutions that are involved in this um, as well as private companies that manage this whole system. So name an institution that is responsible for some of these critical internet resources. I'm going to give you a few and um, take one of these away with you and, and you know, Google it, look into it a little bit. Um, but there's a, in, uh, there's a private nonprofit organization called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. This is incorporated in the state of California. It has um, historic ties to the United States government, which was responsible for fac facilitating the formation of this entity. And there's also a subgroup called IANA, or the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, that hands out some of the, um, allocates large blocks of the internet addresses to regional internet registries. So I've given you a number of institutions. We could spend an entire week discussing the issues around each of these. And uh, there's also, there are also um, other entities such as registrars. Um, I don't know if we have any NASCAR fans in here, but you might know the GoDaddy, uh, Danica Patrick GoDaddy NASCAR car is um, GoDaddy. What is GoDaddy? It's an internet domain name registrar. So that's, that's an example of another category of institutions that have a responsibility over the allocation and assignment of um, these critical internet resources. So there are many of these things. What are some of the policy issues that can come up if you think about how there's a system of institutions that are handing out critical internet resources? Well, think about the alphanumeric names, trademark disputes. So who should, who, who should have united.com? Should that be United Van Lines, United Arab Emirates? Should it be United Airlines? Uh, so, so these things, uh, you know, that's just a one quick example of the types of questions that can arise. So there's a system of governance that helps adjudicate trademark domain name disputes um, called the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy that's um, operated under ICANN. So that's just an example of the kinds of issues that can come up. So you've been to .com websites, to .edu, to .org websites. You may know that there are websites that end in country code, top level domains that are associated with a certain uh, country and administered by the country. But what you might not know is there has been a recent move to expand dramatically the number of top-level domains, such as .com. And that raises uh, a number of issues. So there was um, the .XXX domain, which ran into some policy issues and uh, raises questions about what counts as free expression in the global online pu public sphere and who gets to decide that. Uh, here's, a, here's another example. So there were, a, there were some proposals that came in during this call for an expansion of top-level domains to move beyond .com, .biz, .info, .org, .edu, and the ones that you might know. 
So there was a proposal for dot Patagonia by the company Patagonia. There was a proposal for dot Amazon by uh, Amazon, the company. And some of the governments that have the Amaz Amazon rainforest or the Patagonia region within their borders objected to this. because So you can see an example of a territorial dispute versus uh, something that is related to a trademark holder. So I just, I just raise that as a couple of examples related to critical internet resources. Yes? Sorry, I don't really know what the dot com means at the end. What would that mean? For, is it just sort of like a, dom, like a space that you can fill? Yeah, what, the question is, what exactly does that mean, the .com space or any other top-level domain, for example? Uh, you described it very well. It's a space. It's called a domain, and it is a collection of addresses that would be followed by .com that are administered by a, an entity called a registry that is responsible for mapping a domain name into its associated IP address. So the, the entity that runs a domain or a space would um, be responsible for making sure that there's a global unique aspect to each of the addresses, to make sure that there is, how do we keep a universal internet? That's what this is related to. The registry operator of that domain keeps track of how each domain name in that domain maps to the IP address. And then that is broadcast around the internet. If that starts to get fragmented, then we wouldn't have a single internet. And there are some issues that are, um, you know, that threaten to fragment it. I'll come back to that in a second. That's a great question. On the most basic level, think about your, your mobile phone. When you look at your contacts book, you have a name for each person in there, typically. That name basically equals a phone number that somebody's doing. So the domain registry matches the name of the of the person of the website address to an ident uh, identifier number uh, that is uh, that used to be IPv4, but now it's IP now it's moving to IPv6. So it's a, a list of numbers, and that list of numbers then directs you in the right direction to where to go. So without that kind of equal equals in that registrar, then you would end up somewhere else where you get what you know, everybody get a 404 error, you know, can't find the server or something. So. And a design feature that you should be aware of is that it's called the domain name system. That's a general term to this. It's organized hierarchically. So there is, this is an enormous system. It's a massive database management system that resolves, oh, hundreds of billions of domain names into IP addresses a day. So we're talking about a very large system. It's hierarchically organized because even though um, it, like an a, a company can um, be responsible for the mapping in, um, in their limited domain, and then you have a large uh, top-level domain registry, there's actually something called a root. There's something called the root zone file, and that is the mapping of all of the top-level domains into their associated IP addresses. So, so that the root zone file is at the top, it goes down to top-level domains, and then second-level domains. So it's very hierarchical, and that was a design decision. But an outgrowth of that design decision, as well as the requirement that each of these should be globally unique, each address, it has brought about a certain form of governance where there is a root to this. There is a root zone file. And uh, right now, changes to the root zone file have to be okayed by, um, I believe it's the NTIA within the Department of Commerce. So this is, um, it's, it's a much longer discussion to get into the particulars of that. But just keep in mind that it's hierarchically organized. So that is an area, critical internet resources, that is how tech, the technical architecture intersects with policy and raises issues everywhere from freedom of expression to who gets to be online to um, you know, questions about trademark and other intellectual property rights. Um, let me mention a, a quick other area, and then we'll, if we have questions about this, we'll come back um, in a second. Um, although, we can ask questions right now. I see two hands go up. So, so let's, uh, let's start here and then go over there. Yes? It wasn't related to Philippa's question. It was another question about something you already said. Yes. But I don't know if yours was related to Philippa's question. No. OK. OK, so you were mentioning the different organizations that help govern the internet, like you mentioned, the Organization of California, um, et cetera. And what I still don't understand from that explanation was if you were talking about a dispute that's an international dispute, like what organization looks over that? Because I'm thinking about when I took this geography class in college, 
there is the .tv country code um, that belongs to an island nation in the Pacific, and that this island nation is able to earn a lot of money by selling off the .tv um, code at the end because that's a popular code to have at the end of your um, <coughs> web address. And I just always wondered, like, what? How do they sell that name to a company, and what is this kind of like cross-border right. naming of the websites? right? So there are. <clears throat> We're, we're going to go down this rabbit hole, okay? Um, so there are yes. Um, so there are, there are two kinds of top-level domains. There is something called generic top-level domains, like .com, .edu. Then some of the new proposed ones, like .books, .amazon, .apple, you know, all these. These are generic top-level domains, and that whole system is overseen by ICANN, which is arguably an international organization. So that's what makes internet governance so unique: is that you have these new institutions that are serving as global governance entities that, in some ways, are um, above gov traditional government structures. Now, within ICANN, which oversees the generic top-level domains and the whole system of registrars and registries and the things underneath that, the organization that hands out the numbers, the regional internet registries which are distributed. So there are many entities, right? That I can, there, there's a struggle. I think of ICANN as an international organization. Mm -hmm. And it has something called a government advisory committee that represents some voices of government. It has a non-commercial users constituency. Like different right. governments across the world? Yes, but they don't have authority over ICANN. Okay. But they are advisors to ICANN. But it's, um, it's a very interesting issue if you, if you think about how do you deal with a system that transcends geographical boundaries, yet has all these implications for public policy. Right? So it's, it's the question of legitimacy. In my opinion, ICANN has become very internationalized over the years. Now, what about something that is truly an international policy issue, like the trademark disputes that I mentioned? Well, ICANN, in, the, in consultation with WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, um, came up with this system called the Uniform Domain Name Trademark resolution process that has a series of um, arbitration entities that help to adjudicate these um, trademark infringement claims that come up. So this is something, again, that is kind of outside of traditional governance. Now, you, if you own a trademark to something and you find out that I th one of the most interesting early ones was that someone set up the domain uh, Madonna.com, and it was actually a like a, a pornographic site, and um, Madonna the Entertainer sued, and you know this was going back quite a ways, but that kind of a problem is adjudicated under the Uniform Domain Name Trademark Resolution Process. What about that other issue you mentioned? What was that TV? That's a second kind of top-level domain, and it's called a country code top-level domain, and each country has their own, um, it's called a CCTLD, or country code top-level domain, that is used. And um, have you ever been to a website that ends in a country code top level domain? Absolutely, right? And that's uh, overseen by an entity within the government. So that is, that is associated a little bit more with territorial jurisdiction. And then you have interesting things that come up, like the TV example that you gave. So they can do anything they want with domain, domain names within the TV. What was the question over here? Uh, you already answered it. OK. Is it, on, on the most sure. an anecdote about that particular thing? When uh, Iraq transition happened to India, I was involved with uh, their parliament and their government setting it up. And, and one of the things that NDI had to do was help them get their top level domain name .iq because some country company in Texas had bought it, somehow got it, and the U.S. government was, was instrumental in obviously helping. We had to actually help facilitate the nation get their top level domain name after a transition like that. Right. It was kind of an interesting problem. Absolutely. How much of Palestinians? So right. if you think about it, somehow they got, I don't know, I registered it, but top level, they somehow come, I think a little company that somehow commandeered the, the top level that made that person. Right. So these kinds of disputes happen all the time, and it's uh, you know the, the difference between territorial governance and international governments over the more international issues is in constant. Uh, there's constant tension there. So it's the most basic little thing about it, like this: that every country has like a two-digit TLD code, 
or I think they're all two, two, two right. letters, yeah. They're all two letters, and it's basically the equivalent of that, that equals mark. It's just that country is, is responsible for managing anything registered under that code. And so in the TV case, they can generate revenue by selling subscriptions. Just like you buy a .com or something like that from GoDaddy, they can sell those subscriptions in their country and make money from that. Let, let me raise another quick issue of internet governance. And then uh, whatever sounds most interesting, we can drill down at the end during the discussion period. But feel free to ask questions as I describe this. Well, what about standard setting? How is that a policy issue? So often when you, you raise an issue like that, you, people's eyes start to glaze over. First of all, what do I mean by an internet protocol or an internet standard? Give me some examples. There's things like the characters that we use. Like you, we use, like, uh, yeah, from in characters or whatever, or not, like we don't use char like Chinese characters to type in. There's a standard called the American Standard Code for International uh, for Information Interchange, which is based on Latin or Roman characters. And um, over the course of time, there has been a need to expand um, the domain name system, for example, into non-Roman characters, whether Cyrillic, Arabic, or Chinese characters. Right. So a different standard was necessary to do that. Uh, what are some standards that you're using right now? Uh, some of you are on devices. So what is an example of an internet standard? So these are the protocols that are necessary to, for computing devices to interact. It's very easy to forget that that is socially constructed. Right? They're rules that are made by people in a very similar way to how cultural interactions and language interactions among people are cultural constructs. Um, I know that all of you travel internationally quite a bit. And depending on where you are in the world, you greet people in a different way. So in some cases, you will kiss someone on each side of the cheek. In other places, you'll bow. In other places, you'll shake hands. And computing devices have those same kinds of rules for how they interact, except it's more technical. It has to do with how to structure the bits, how to format the bits, how to uh, standardize things in a way so that one computing device anywhere in the world that's based on a certain set of standards can communicate with other devices elsewhere in the world that are based on the same standards. How is this a political issue? First of all, what are some examples of other standards? Wi-Fi is a standard. MP3. When you're at the gym listening to an MP3 file, it's a standard for formatting um, audio and compressing audio information. Uh, what are some other ones? that you, Bluetooth wireless. Some people have a headset. So there are all of these standards. Um, certainly, you're familiar with HTTP for accessing the web. Now, these are well-known standards, but there are only a few examples of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of standards that are necessary to make the internet work. And it, this is a um, historian of uh, technology, Janet Abate, in her book, Inventing the Internet, which she wrote in 1999, uh, said that protocols are politics by other means. So how can that be in such an, a technical area? So how about BitTorrent? BitTorrent is a really straightforward technical area, a technical protocol that is designed to efficiently facilitate file sharing. But the way that it is implemented is almost, it's, it makes it almost always very closely associated with piracy. There are also a set of standards that are designed to improve accessibility to the internet for the disabled. And that's an area where you can really understand the public policy implications of how technology is designed and how the standards are designed in the technologies. And certainly encryption, uh, many of you are into the area of cybersecurity, so you know that encryption protocols and how that is designed affects privacy online. So some are designed to protect privacy. In other cases, their um, encryption is dumped down in a way to provide back doors for governments. So it's an area that balances issues like security versus civil liberties. So I raise standards as an issue to put on your radar screen as uh, something that is a, t a technical area that's in need of further study to look at the international public policy issues. Um, so um, cybersecurity, I won't spend very much time on that, uh, except to mention that in addition to the things that we hear about in the news and even cybersecurity analysts uh, that study the national security implications and uh, warfare through cybersecurity, like the Stuxnet code. There's a whole other area of internet governance related cybersecurity that I'd like to mention. And that has to do with institutions that are set up to deal with 
trust online and deal with issues of responding to security problems that arise. So I'll just mention um, a couple of them. I think I will choose certificate authorities. How many people have heard of certificate authorities? This no is very important. These are the things that, uh, that make sure that when you're talking to your field staff that they're talking securely over Google Hangouts and stuff like that. Right. So there are these <laughs> there are these public inst public private institutions that um, serve as trusted third parties that authenticate certain transactions over the internet. So when you get onto a browser and you go to buy something for Father's Day on Amazon.com, Father's Day is coming up, everyone should be shopping, then the, you, there's an authentication process that ensures, it, it ensures that Amazon.com is the website that it says it is. So there are these trusted third parties. You could actually go in your browser and look and see what kind of certificate authorities are accepted. So I'll mention that there's a whole system that is behind the scenes that people don't necessarily see. I'll just mention one other kind of institution. Again, these are non-governmental institutions. And they're called CERTs, or uh, Computer Emergency Response Teams. And these are there are hundreds of computer emergency response teams that are located around the world that respond to internet security threats. So um, I'll mention a few of those institutions. So I'm giving you a flavor of how the internet currently is administered and governed by these new institutions. Um, so interconnection governance, um, I think I'm going to skip over that in, um, in the interest of time. But I'll just say that, it, as I mentioned before, there are buildings that you can walk into and see equipment, raised flooring, air conditioning, um, computer devices, switches, and fiber optic cable that interconnects. There are interconnection points around the world that w where um, network operators can join. And they make private agreements among each other uh, to, uh, to determine how do they exchange information, how will they charge each other for this exchange of inf information, how will they secure these interactions. And it's a very, very important part of internet governance. Um, there was a, as you know, a senator who called the internet a series of pipes in a very funny Daily Show skit based on that. Um, Google that and see the uh, John Stewart skit. But you know what? There really are pipes <laughs> in addition to all of these other things, and they can join. And you don't really hear about it that much until there is an outage. And when there is an outage at an internet exchange point, then you suddenly hear about it. Some of the outages are not due only through the repressive um, techniques of some governments that take down the internet. But they also can be outages due to disagreements that are economic among the providers. So there have been some very high profile disputes between uh, network operators where they say we're disagreeing on how to exchange information. So that can cause an outage as well. So that's an important area. So where, do, where does funding for the for the internet exchange points where they come together, uh, usually they're nonprofit organizations that are funded in a member-driven way. So if you think about an internet exchange point, I'll I'll just uh, give you an example of one. The London Internet Exchange, or Lynx, has uh, hundreds of members. They're mostly network operators like AT&T, for example, but they also have members that are large content providers. So for example, Google connects in at internet exchange points. And there's also another category of provider that would be a member um, that would be a content distribution network um, like Akamai, for example. So there are these co companies that are designed to distribute content out over the internet and bring it closer to people. They can join with network operators at internet exchange points. It's a very, very important area of internet governance that I think doesn't, you know, it's the infrastructure area that doesn't get enough attention because there are, it's a, they serve as concentration points for potential government censorship and outages. Um, they are the um, economic arrangements are very important, and it primarily has been an area of private ordering and private agreements among network operators and other members at the internet exchange points. But there has been a movement, uh, such as in a recent ITU conference called the World Conference on International Telecommunication, and that looking at a new this treaty called the International Telecommunication Regulations, that. Um, well, one of the proposals going into that looked at this exact area and said, 
there should be different kinds of agreements. Um, so without getting into that in great detail, think about interconnection as in a future area of internet governance that could get a lot of attention as there are movements to have greater government regulation and intervention in these areas. So I'll flag that as an issue. So we talked briefly about critical internet resources, about standards, interconnection, and um, I want to mention the policy role of information intermediaries, which is in the news with PRISM and other issues. So a very important and large body of internet governance as it currently works is enacted by private information intermediaries. So we have reputation engines like Angie's List, Yelp, making decisions about when things can be taken down on their sites. We have um, the Google transparency reports are something that you should look at if you haven't had a chance to do that. Just look up Google transparency reports. And what Google does is they uh, make public much of the information or some of the information about requests that they receive from various governments to take down information. It's really interesting when you start looking at these requests. So in some parts of the world it is illegal to insult um, the monarchy. So they get a lot of requests to take down that. In um, places like Brazil they have very strong hate uh, speech regulations, so there are a lot of requests to take down information um, from various Google platforms, for example, and Twitter. Um, so the information intermediaries, whether search engines, content repositories, reputation engines, or other private platforms that facilitate the exchange of information, they are playing a role in making decisions about when to take down information. Because there is a very big disconnect between the number of requests that they receive and the requests that they carry out. And that's where some gov private governance is enacted. And um, it's a very interesting area to look at if you want to look at the Twitter transparency reports or the Google transparency reports, so delegated censorship. Now, um, they also set policies in and of themselves through the privacy policies and social media and uh, email policies. How many times do you sign up for a service and you just check off uh, yes, I agree without reading the details of that, but that actually is setting policy about what information is shared about you. This ties back to PRISM. There is an enormous um, infrastructure of identity information that is gathered about us on a daily basis. So we have a Faustian bargain where we use things for free. What do we use for free online? We're so used to free things. So we use uh, social media. We don't pay for email for the most part. We don't pay for the use of search engines. We don't pay for the use of X, Y, and Z, almost everything that we use. So how are those things funded? It's not that uh, there's no currency underneath there. It's just that the currency has moved from between the consumer and the private companies to the third-party advertising firms and um, companies that are selling, uh, using this uh, for advertising. So the Faustian bargain is that we use these things for free and all of this information is gathered ab about us. Whether it's something related to a physical hardware device, it, our phone number, we saw in the uh, Verizon uh, recent revelations about the geolocation and data that is gathered. So what I'd like everyone to do later is to just pick a social media platform that you use, say let's say Twitter or um, really anything. You know, so, so Facebook, um, I see a lot of Apple devices here. So look at the Apple privacy policies and they disclose the types of information that are gathered about us and it really does turn into quite an enormous identity infrastructure. So an issue that I'd like to raise for the future of internet governance is do we want the possibility of anonymity? Uh, you do work in freedom of expression. We're at the point where there are a number of global trends that are pushing back against the possibility of anonymity. Back in the early 90s, there was this famous New Yorker cartoon, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. That's just not the case anymore. 
right? So there's an identity infrastructure. There's a feeling of anonymity when we're using the online platforms. But really, a lot of information is gathered, much of it to um, enable the, uh, the advertising. And in certain parts of the world, and you know, some of the things that we've heard with the PRISM, it's for national security reasons or political purposes as well. But um, that's not the only issue when it comes to anonymity. So we have the private platforms gathering information in order to monetize the products and create online advertising. And this is an excellent thing from the standpoint of innovation and it fuels innovation, but um, it's something that needs to always be balanced against civil liberties. So there's a constant tension between the conflicting values there. Um, there are also movements around the world to have real na name identifiers associated with getting on the internet. We saw a proposal coming from China about that. In certain places like India and Brazil, there are I the public should be involved in making these decisions. Um, so I've, I've raised a few um, issues in each of these areas. Just the final one, um, internet architecture and intellectual property. This is a really important area of internet governance. So it's not just about intellectual property, just like in other areas of internet governance. This is also about freedom of expression, and it's also about innovation. I always hesitate to ask in my classes how many people have illegally downloaded a copyrighted movie or um, so I'm not, I'm not going to ask, okay? I'm the kind of person who has never downloaded an illegal, um, I've never downloaded a movie or music illegally because I'm an internet governance scholar. Uh, but you can't help but notice when you're on YouTube, you're, download, you're looking at a video and uh, there's a copyright violation. So the norm is moving towards uh, copyright violations as the way that people access information now and the way that we share information. So we have, um, it, we have this issue of um, as these traditional forces like large content providers lose control of their own, the monetization of their own content. And as governments lose control over the control of their own inf of information within their boundaries, there is a turn to infrastructures of internet governance to find a way to do this. Laws are failing. Traditional mechanisms of going after individual infringement, not making a dent on how we share and access information now. So there's an interest in moving towards infrastructures of internet governance. And in my opinion, this is a problem because there's a lot of collateral damage that goes on. So for example, there are movements to enforce intellectual property rights by what are called three strikes laws that will cut off a household's internet access if there have been a number of uh, violations. So, so here you have a, a potential system cutting off an entire household, possibly someone's business that is run from the house, uh, someone's uh, ability to do schoolwork, all because the teenager was doing, you know, sharing files illegally. So that's that's an issue I want to flag. Um, there also is the turn to uh, the domain name system for intellectual property rights enforcement. The SOPA and PIPA debates uh, that were the most controversial were about this exact issue of to what extent should the domain name system be used for intellectual property rights enforcement and what's the collateral damage not only to freedom of expression and due process but also to issues related to the security and stability of the internet, which is something that's of um, great concern to me. So my, my new book goes uh, through these different areas, and I also uh, raise a number of themes. You know, it has a theoretical component where I raise some of the theoretical, um, like how theories of internet governance and how you study internet governance. Um, as you know, I have an engineering background. I have two engineering degrees, but I also have my PhD is in a field called science and technology studies, which studies technology through different sociological and philosophical lenses. So I'm very influenced by that and, you know, opening up the black box of technology and trying to uncover the values that are at stake. So I think what I'll do in, um, maybe the remaining five minutes is to, if we have five, five more minutes, is to just raise a couple of themes of internet governance and you'll see how this all ties back to PRISM as well. So um, why don't I just describe three of these in the interest of time. So the first thing I'd like to suggest is that when you start looking at internet governance, but really any information and communication technologies, you're reminded about how arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power. 
So it's not just the institutional system and the traditional governments that regulates the technologies, but also the design of technology and how it is deployed. So technologies, how they're designed, how they're deployed, embed values related to privacy, to access to knowledge, to national security. So we've already discussed a few examples of that. Um, but this is, um, this is the case even, not only through design of things like protocols, I mentioned accessibility issues for the disabled, right? So you design a certain form of public policy into the technologies. But it also is um, in the area of infrastructure, like just what's value laden about infrastructure. So how network operators manage their own networks is something that embeds values. So especially if they use invasive content inspection techniques such as deep packet inspection or deep pa uh, called DPI. So if a, t a company is using a technology that looks at the actual content as opposed to just the administrative information and IP addresses around that content, that kind of a technology has a certain implication for po policy and privacy in particular. So that's one theme that I raise in my book. Second theme is how internet governance infrastructures are absolutely becoming a proxy for content control and other forms of economic and political structures. So I mentioned how this is the case in intellectual property rights enforcement, but you really don't need to go any further than uh, the kill switch type issues. I don't like to use that word because there is no kill switch, but there are kill switches. There are areas where um, internet access can be cut off. You know, whether it's of Twitter, Twitter can be cut off in certain parts of the world, or um, if it's in other large platforms, or um, conceivably an entire top-level domain could get cut off. Um, that has never happened, and I doubt if it ever will. But there are these areas of concentration and control points, and these control points are being turned to as a proxy for other kinds of power. Uh, struggles that are going on, whether economic or political. Uh, then the final theme, and I'll conclude with this, is the issue of the privatization of governance. Governance is traditionally understood as uh, the obviously the efforts of sovereign nation states to control behavior and information within or through their borders. But as we know from the Internet's infrastructure, much of that transcends national boundaries and the governance is being taken up by new global institutions such as standard setting bodies, such as the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, such as um, these new entities that are designed to handle um, everything from IP address distribution to um, you know, potentially inter interconnection regulation, and also the private entities that I mentioned like Google that are setting policy in areas related to privacy, freedom of expression, defamation, cyberbullying, all of these things. So this is part of a larger trend in governance of privatization, whether it's in warfare or in internet governance. But that's the last theme that I would like to mention. So the truth is that the internet is governed, but that this is not a fixed governance. It is a governance that is in constant state of flux. And the motivation behind the work that I do is uh, very driven by freedom of expression. That is a value that motivates um, what I study and what I do. And I think that a lot of the issues in internet governance, many of them that are technically concealed and institutionally concealed, need to be brought to um, the public's attention. And so I'm very happy to be here today to raise some of the issues and have a chance to discuss it with you. So thank you very much. So one thing, we're going we're gonna to do discussion now, so we're going to ask questions. Yes. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, that is important to understand in internet governance terms is that when you do country programs, there's a lot of things, especially when you're using IT uh, software or you know, technology, is that there's every country deals with the internet slightly differently. And so we provide at ICT, we provide you with country profiles that provide information on uh, the various uh, rules and regulations in those different countries, the cost of using technology in those countries things like that. And so getting back to internet architecture, there are definitely choke points. Every so often a ship's anchor will drop and it'll cut fiber optic line and you'll, you'll lose internet connection in a, in a part of the world or it'll slow it down significantly. Uh, and so uh, 
And then there's other instances where I used to work at a, on another program where we sent satellite phones into a particular country to, so that they could still maintain access to the internet and report out. Uh, so these are different things you have to consider to, to try. But internet governance is incredibly important and, uh, in, in everything that you do in develop your programs. Uh, because if you're using technology, you have to kind of understand the rules of the road, understand the threats to the people that you're working with, and understand how those apply back to this, this how, how to get democracy and, and human rights act, uh, programs started. So if you have any specific questions or questions in general. I have a question. The, uh, Thank you. Really interesting. This is Chris Mintz, the director of IT. The, one of the things that I deal with on this policy that affects all of us in this room and our partners around the world is, is we use Google Apps and we, you know, a lot of our partners do. And Prism kind of sh shine, shine a light a little bit on government requests, U.S. government requests. We know that we know that Google has been entertaining government requests from different intelligence agencies across the government for a while. NSA is just the next one that we now know about. So I didn't think that Prism was all that big of a deal, frankly, because we, you know, they're already doing. We watched the transparency report. The thing that concerns me isn't so much about USG getting Google data about our staff on request through a legitimate legal process, but it's these other countries. If you guys look at the transparency report of Google, you'll see that all the countries are listed. For example, in Russia, they may only respond to 10 or 12 percent of the requests for not just not just fully content offline, but handing over content about people, right? Uh, your Gmail or your Google Docs or whatever. So the question is, when you talk to the Google policy people, they will say, we have a policy that will only uh, respond to legitimate judicial legal requests for information from any government. But a lot of those regimes are illegitimate by, by definition almost. And so what Google says to us in private discussions is, we'll do the right thing, essentially. We, we know that, that the you know, Lib Libyans were bad and they're better now, but we'll be careful and things like that. So there's a very much of a subjective layer on top of a fairly transparent policy from Google and Facebook and others. So my question to you, I guess, is do you know of any organizations that are, is there a policy through a kind of channel that we should be thinking about to help help us understand better what the companies are going to do about those, those policies? Is there an international framework that we should be trying to push? to get companies to all at least use the same subjective means by which they decide to give information to foreign governments. Right. Yes. Uh, there's there's a lot in your commentary and there's questions, and it's and it's uh, I I agree that it is a very very important issue, and you know we see the reason I call it the privatization of governance is because I'm I'm grateful that private companies don't just acquiesce to every request that's out there. So we see that in the transparency reports. We have lots of examples of this, but it's very difficult. Um, let's, just, um, let's just say that you and I start a company and we're an information intermediary. We have to walk that fine line of acquiescing to legal requests within uh, the boundaries of a certain country, but also considering things like our reputation in the world and we wouldn't want to be handing over personal information about a dissident um, as uh, Yahoo Yahoo got in great trouble quite a while ago for handing over some names of uh, Chinese dissidents to the government and they ended up going to jail um, so the collateral damage to your own reputation as a private company is uh, is huge right I'm just I'm just looking at it from this perspective yeah. and you know we have many many examples of private companies that are saying no we won't you know, there are all kinds of uh, examples of this on the transparency reports, and I'm sure you've heard some anecdotal information as well. So, but the question is, um, look at the difference between the number of requests that are received from legitimate governments and the number of requests that uh, these kinds of companies um, to which they acquiesce, right? So that, that delta is the question here. Like, how do they make that determination? And I, th I would recommend uh, getting, in getting involved in looking at the Global Network Initiative. So this whole issue of corporate social responsibility is an enormous one. It's something that is in flux. I think it's something that is not at all resolved yet. But the Global Network Initiative is, is um, the GNI is in is, uh, is an entity that are located right here in Washington that are uh, a cooperative of different companies who are looking to do norm setting in various areas such as privacy and freedom of expression. So I think that norm setting is very important. Um, what legitimizes this privatization? 
I think that transparency and accountability is absolutely essential. So I'm, you know, I think there needs to be way more transparency from the countries, right? It's from the companies, but also from the countries, right? So that's it's a this is a basic question of internet governance: is on what basis do private companies and new global institutions have the legitimacy to set policies in areas that have historically been the purview of uh, of governments? And uh, you know some of the ways to provide that legitimacy. Obviously, a lot of it comes from expertise, but transparency, accountability, very, very important. So, the, so Google is, as you know, is trying to force the NSA or encourage the NSA to allow them to speak about what requests are. They, they're actually muffled. Google is actually being muffled by law. Not even tell us how many requests they did. Like that. So, we believe that's happening. Um, uh, with the GNI, we do work with them, and, and you know it's, it's small and it's fledgling a little bit. But, but if, if you kind of agree with us, that's really the only mechanism that we're aware of. And, and there are more companies that sign up. And, and, right, and there there are um, in as part of the Internet Governance Forum, which is really just a dialogue about internet governance. Um, that's a place where there has been some norm setting about these kinds of things as well. So that is a little bit more led by civil society rather than by private entities, but. There's no, how do you go from norm setting to implementing these things in a private company? Um, that, that's the question. Yes. Uh, what's always, I guess, fascinated me about the internet is that you have this giant international architecture to make sure that everyone's connecting to the same thing. But when you get down to the country level, everyone's access to this starts to differ. Whether it's the Great Wall, the Great Firewall of China, or a lot of the countries that NDI works in, the internet is um, nominally or nominally accessible, but priced out because they charge by the byte, or Google charges five bucks an hour to get to the internet with no one can afford. And so, my question is: these kind of these price controls on the internet and how much it costs to access the internet does it actually differ from country to country, or? Are these all just kind of local economic or local controlled games being played out? Is there any um, justification for the price? Right. So there are a couple of levels uh, to that question. Global internet governance usually refers to issues that cut across nations. But there are also some region-specific or nation-specific issues that are so important for the ability to reach the global internet that they're usually thought of as a global internet governance issue. So one of those issues is internet access and broadband penetration and the economic issues associated with that. And um, the related one is net neutrality issues called different things in different parts of the world, which are another way to um, provide a disconnect. Now, how how is the pricing determined in various parts of the world? I want to tie this together to the broader global internet governance issue. Some of the pricing that is charged locally depends on what it costs the local provider to connect to the global internet. So that's where this issue of interconnection is very important. So we have a system with large incumbent what used to be called tier one internet providers who have been around for a long time and they have agreements to peer with each other. They exchange information for free. So in some parts of the world where we have newer entrants, um, what's, the, what's the economic incentive for the larger providers to connect to them? The economic incentive is that those new providers would be considered customers and would pay for like a paid peering ar arrangement or paid transit to get to the rest of the internet. So that is a very important issue that sets pricing. So a lot of the arrangements in interconnection are passed on to the local providers. Um, another issue there is net neutrality, which is not necessarily about um, access uh, pricing, but about what can be throttled back for various reasons and you know what we know from the history of the internet is that it's not a theoretical issue that there have been many cases of throttling back speeds or blocking access whether for competitive advantage for political gain or something else but um, the, the differences uh, some of them are truly local issues and the cost of labor in that region for the network operator, the cost of um, installation of the infrastructure so that would be a local issue 
and what the market would bear. But there's also a more global issue, and that has to do with the interconnection exchange. The, the, the anti-neutrality crowd always comes out and says that we're running out of internet space, we're running out of interesting space, we have to be able to throttle back and everything like that. Is that in your in your near future at all? Or? Okay, there is a, let me let me uh, give you an engineer's perspective on that, uh, and and also someone who is an advocate of freedom of expression. How do you how do you provide um, the space for companies to innovate? And uh, you know, for example, a wireless provider that has to deal with uh, very high bandwidth uh, videos being sent over their their links. Um, how do they deal with the network management aspects of this of that while still providing an open platform for innovation? So the way I this is just my own personal opinion. Um, I think that there has to be some uh, for network management reasons. There has to be some ability to prioritize the delivery of some content over other. As long as it's done in a homogenous way and doesn't privilege a certain application or an, over another application, like that's that's provided by an entity, a certain entity, like a content company. So, for example. If I uh, download an email, it doesn't matter at all if there's any delay to the email. I, it will be imperceptible to me. But if I'm downloading, um, I'm, I'm Skyping with someone in another country, it's very, um, you know, audio over the internet is very uh, susceptible to what's called latency, which is the delay, um, you know, the buffering, can't really take care of that. If anyone who's been on a satellite call understands that you don't want to have that delay, it's very awkward, like, do you love me? And there's a two-second delay. It can be very awkward uh, for people having an international conversation. Um, so, so in a, I have no idea why I used that example. Um, <laughs> that's right. So if you, so if you look at audio or the delivery of things that are streaming li in, live in real time, it's very, very important to have those kinds of packets prioritized over things that can handle the delay. So one thing that network management does is it takes care of that, right? But that's a totally different issue than throttling back a service just because it's provided by a company that competes with your core services. So I, I see it as um, not a black and white issue, but a context dependent issue. So some of it has to do with network management and traffic management and routine network management and the inspection that has to take place to make sure that there's high performance versus uh, pushing back against the things that are um, competitively um, disadvantaging new newer entrants or certain content providers because they're not providing the access. So you're kind of asking, is there a real problem with data, data throttling? Think about it like this. You have a, a single pipe that's filled with water and you're trying to fill four sinks. Of pretty, pretty, pretty easy to do, four sinks. But then make it that 100 sinks. So the pressure, the water pressure that that single pipe can feed drops dramatically if you don't filter in which way the, the traffic can go. And these are, I mean, electrons in the, essentially work in, in much the same way. And there have been examples of discrimination that have occurred in access. I mean, that, so, so it's not a hypothetical problem. So when um, Verizon was approached by NARAL, um, an abortion rights action league, to request uh, an SMS code whoever was receiving this request said uh, it's too controversial. Right, so that's an example of the kinds of content discrimination that can occur. Uh, Verizon corrected that uh, fairly quickly. We also know about um, instances of Comcast throttling back traffic that was competing with their services. We also know of examples of AT&T um, you know, acknowledging that they're throttling back the traffic of users who have an unlimited subscription plan but are using too much, right? So you have, um, min many of you use AT&T, you might be grandfathered into um, the unlimited subscription. And so they have occasionally throttled back traffic. So these kinds of things do absolutely happen. But it's, so net neutrality, uh, no matter what people say, is not a black and white issue. Right? So the, the people who um, believe that, uh, maybe don't understand some of the the engineering characteristics of how the internet works and the the, the folks who say um, you know no net neutrality you know they're the, the anti-neutrality people um, don't understand how uh, discrimination can occur at so many different levels whether it's against a particular user against an organization for political reasons or against an entity because um, of um, economic competition. So it's, uh, I guess I come down somewhere in between and I think it's very granular and context dependent. Any other questions? Yeah. 
questions? I, I'm getting the page proofs back, and um, I, this this book. Um, so I, I've addressed some of this um, in other books that I've written as well. But the the new book that's coming out probably will be about 300 pages or so. Wow. Question in the back. Yeah, I had a question about uh, anonymity. Um, you brought that up a little bit earlier. Sure. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about um, certain tools that people can use in order to preserve that or um, enjoy some. Uh, and I was wondering if you could comment on maybe the core projects or certain services like um, do not track or do not respond to requests to track. Or what, what are some of the things that people can use? to preserve anonymity, or are any of them really useful? Um, I guess it's sort of open-ended, I guess. Right. The answer to this question is uh, the game whack-a-mole. That's the answer to it. Because um, every time we see repression, we see new circumvention technologies that are designed. And um, you know, I'm using that term repression, but I don't just mean repression. I mean, also, if you see um, <clears throat> concerns about privacy because of new business models based on tracking someone and uh, locational data, behavioral data, things that fuel online advertising right now. Then you see these new mechanisms that try to work around that. The do not track protocol is one example of that. But that only tackles a very specific area of privacy to not um, track information if it's um, activated in a browser. So that's very useful. Uh, you see Tor and anonymization uh, software that, that uses other, that, that tackles other specific areas. But what concerns me about this, and actually my next uh, project that um, it, it will be a very large project, it's called Technologies of Descent, that looks at this exact issue. Um, it asks the basic question of what are the characteristics of technical architecture that are necessary to preserve infrastructures of freedom of expression. Because the, the examples that you mentioned <coughs> excuse me, are two examples. But sometimes, if you have an activist in a certain part of the world using one of these technologies, they may not fully understand the limitations of them. And then well, the reason I say whack-a-mole is because every time we have a good circumvention technology, we then have a new government uh, effort to circumvent the circumvention. So it's, um, you know, things keep getting amped up and ramped up. So um, part of the solution could be to design the overall infrastructure in a way that provides the possibility for anonymity in a way that's more um, uh, consistent around the world. But I, I really am concerned about anonymity. I mean, so d there's a big difference between delegated anonymity or, you know, what, what would be the right word for that? Um, traceable anonymity. So you want, uh, you, you want the ability to do law enforcement. If you've ever been the victim of identity theft, you're going to want the government to step in and find out what happened. And you want them to be able to go to an ISP and find out, you know, to find out what happened to protect you. Um, if there is child pornography, you want the ability to find out who's doing what in, in being able to. So that's traceable anonymity, where there are the uh, you know, transparent and accountable and law-abiding mechanisms to find that information out. Now, that's really, really different from a larger concern about how we're right on the cusp of losing the um, Markets using Facebook and um, you know proprietary systems that are based on real identification. <clears throat> I would add the uh, ability to have even any anonymity, and some of that is what we're self that that we're also choosing as markets to go away from interoperability. This is a really important issue. So we made a difficult move all throughout the history of the internet to, to go from proprietary platforms where one company would use a set of protocols uh, by IBM and then they couldn't communicate with another, they couldn't exchange information with another company like suppliers and purchasers.
because there was lack of compatibility. It's the same thing with consumers. Um, how many people remember AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe and the proprietary online systems of the 1990s where you could go on AOL and communicate with America Online people, but you couldn't communicate with your friends who were on Prodigy? Right? There, there was not the same kind of interoperability. It was a really big move to go from that it was not technically easy, and it was a different, a difficult innovation and institutional issue to go from that to having interoperability. What's going on now? Well, now we have a, a resurgence of proprietary platforms in cloud computing, in social media. Even a great technology like Skype is partially based on proprietary protocols, and so you could only... Uh, what if email were like Skype? And you could only um, email for free with certain people, but you know, that were on Gmail, but if you wanted to go and, and email someone with uh, like an NDI email address, we'd have to pay to do that. Well, that's what's happening in new voice platforms and, and um, you know, certain kinds of new systems in cloud computing and e-health, other areas. So I'm, I'm concerned about interoperability as well. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to, uh, so we've talked a lot about how information is sort of uh, gathered or tracked or are working in real time. Um, to what degree and who, because I know information archive exists, we just said Google training today, you can go back to the original edit of one of your Google Docs, and even if it was five years ago, and uh, you know upload that original document. So that sort of uh, brought up the question, is it, is it private companies? Is it a mixture of private companies and government? Is it some of these international institutions? Um, where, like, where, how is this information archived? Where is it kept? Is it kept in servers? Right, so that's a, there's a different answer depending on what information we're talking about. So let's uh, give a few examples. And, and I actually, I'm actually worried about the archiving. I feel like there's not going to be enough archiving. So what's going to happen when Facebook is no longer the dominant platform? Um, what has happened to all social media platforms? They've been supplanted by something else. All of your data is there. Will you be able to take your data to the new platform? Uh, it's just a, a question that I want to raise. So that's an example of, the, of, of private mediation. Um, so a lot of things are stored. Uh, if you're a, an avid Google user and you're using Google Docs all the time, so that's dependent on Google servers. Now, this is not as big of an issue for us as consumers because we're making that decision to go with a private company and we're, we're getting free services and we're getting benefit. We totally have the option of walking to another cloud computing provider if we want. But what about if we're a government and we have public documents? So I, I, a while ago I heard someone who worked uh, in the state of Massachusetts uh, a government worker in the state of Massachusetts say something like this, I'll just paraphrase, it's an overriding imperative of democracy that we're not going to lock up our public documents in a proprietary format that's dependent on a company that may or may not be here in 10 years. Right? Yeah. So what's a proprietary format is the question there. That's, there's a lot of debate around that. Um, my last book, Opening Standards, The Global Politics of Interoperability, tried to tack tackle that subject. But the, the issue of openness, interoperability, uh, tr portability of data, these, these are things that need to be worked out, right? So a lot of this is privately maintained. Are there any public archives? Well, there are some really interesting... I have a doctoral student who is um, doing her research for her dissertation right now on digital public archives that aren't necessarily mediated by private companies and the various efforts and what it is they're archiving, uh, what about the stability of that. Uh, so it really depends on what information. A lot of your information is stored by what information that you have provided online is not stored by a private company. That's the question I'll ask you. So you use, uh, what, what email do you use? Anything, anything I've had to doc up, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, anything I've had to doc up. Um. Well, what, uh, what email do you use in your private life? So, so Gmail is stored on Google servers. So, and then I guess to go along with that, do any of these big um, sort of like, uh, international institutions or 
um, you know, at any of these choke points, do they keep logs of the information that just travels through each day in the same way that, say, Verizon keeps a log of every you know, phone call? Because I'm like, I guess that also relates to Prism. Clearly, to, to data mine, there has to be a, a cluster of, of data there. It's not that they're doing this constantly all the time. So I'm wondering, as this information is, is traveling, um, if I'm sending an email to someone in China, is it possible that along the way that email is getting archived in multiple institutions, it's getting checked, or, I mean, I, I guess you really just brought up this idea that the internet isn't, isn't a cloud, like you said, it's, it's a bunch of different connections. At these different connections, there's different administered clouds. So. Right, the, and uh, so this is different all across the world, and depending on who the provider is, but um, at a minimum, you have to access the internet through uh, some kind of uh, an access system. Uh, much of it we do on our cell phones, right? So I, I again, I, I encourage you. Why don't you go to um, do you use AT and T? Do you use Verizon? Okay, so go to Verizon's um, end user agreement. Uh, you know they, they have a, a pretty good public statement on what kind of information is collected, right? Now, there's a big difference between collecting the administrative information and collecting the actual content. So what is routinely done is uh, things such as uh, phone number, location, unique hardware identifiers like an Ethernet card, virtual identifiers like an IP address. Uh, these kinds of things are routinely gathered by internet service providers and by anyone that you're accessing the internet through. Um, the more difficult question is to what extent content is stored and aggregated. So if the company that you're talking about is a content provider that you're hiring or choosing to store your content, of course they absolutely have it. It's on their servers, right? But the, the broader question is when it passes through these other points, how can it, is it being um, detected? Well, there's a technology now that is making this possible. It's called deep packet inspection. And I don't know uh, the particulars of you know wh which uh, providers are doing what with this, except I know that they're all using it, um, mainly for network management uh, capability. But deep packet inspection is something that's relatively new, and it's only uh, it's only been enabled by the increases in processing power in microprocessors, in computing devices, in routers. And whereas it used to be the case, well, you, you know how internet gets routed over the internet. It gets broken down into pieces. Each piece, called a packet, has its own um, IP address appended to it, the source and the destination address. And it has something called a header that includes that, as well as other administrative over overhead information. But then it has the payload, which is the actual content. Well, it never used to be possible possible to look at the payload. It just took up too much processing power. But now it's very possible to do that. Um, various deep packet inspection techniques do it. And we might actually want companies to do that to identify worms, viruses, Trojan horse programs. Like for cybersecurity purposes, it's very helpful to do that. But what else can and will they do? There have been some cases of um, using that to tailor advertising, yeah. for example. I, I don't want that to happen. Right, so the, the technology is there, and I, I think there's, I know that there's not a lot of transparency about what is being done. Um, so privately, um, companies will explain, well, of course we use deep packet inspection. Um, can, what, what can companies do with this? They can, they can do intellectual property rights enforcement using deep packet inspection. They can use it to gather content in the similar uh, similar way that uh, when you use Gmail, you'll have tailored ads based on the content of your email, right? But that could happen. That could be gathered through deep packet inspection by the ISP, monetize it with new advertising. So the technology is there, and. Um, a lot of times we don't know what is going on because of trade secrecy and how the, the various techniques work. That's a, that I, I raise that in the last chapter of my book as an open issue about you know, the future of privacy with deep packet inspection and new technologies. What's our expectation of privacy? If we view the internet as just a large, public, international, global system, yet 
the same time, we want it to be very private and anonymous. What, what should we expect? Well, I, I've mentioned a lot of ways that we don't have privacy now because of online advertising practices, because of government efforts, and um, you know, a variety of surveillance mechanisms that are designed to do, to do certain things. Now, there's a good side of that, and that is that uh, those practices have enabled um, efficient network management. They've enabled the monetization and new innovation platforms that um, provide new opportunities for freedom of expression through all of these free software platforms. The downside of that is that privacy is inextricably also linked to freedom of expression. And you know, think about the history of the United States and the role of anonymous pamphlets and things like that. <clears throat> I, I'm hoping that we have, um, that we retain the possibility of anonymity um, going forward. Right, so, so the European Union has very strong privacy protections. Um, it varies from country to country. There are two different questions in your question. One is, what is happening right now, and what do we want to happen? I mean, I'll ask you, do you, do you think that should, there should be some kind of international treaty on privacy? Um, and would, and if, if government said, oh, we'll never gather private information about an individual, is that something that can be believed in different parts of the world? I mean, it's, it's such a complicated political issue. And I believe it is one of the open issues, like what will the future of anonymity be? not only the future of um, traceable anonymity, where you would want law enforcement to be able to get information, but just the future of, inf of anonymity on the surface, right? The, the ability to use a pseudonym, for example, or the ability to get onto a computer without handing over an ID. ID. So that is uh, very much in flux, and once it's gone, it's gone. Well, thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot to think about. <laughs>